Welcome to Real Money Talks. Real strategies from the money makers and the world changers that you can use to make millions, keep those millions, multiply your wealth, and build your team. Here's your host, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View, Laurel Langmire. Hi, this is Laurel, and welcome back to Laurel's Real Money Talks, a podcast where we're talking about how to make money, how to keep money, how to invest it, and with a team that is absolutely critical. You cannot do this alone. In fact, they uh, coined the word uh, team made millionaires because that's how we're made. And uh, today we're going to talk about the making money side, but it actually will become a great asset because it's intellectual property. We're going to talk about writing books. So I have with me a dear friend, writer, Eric Delabar. He's three-time New York Times bestseller, worked seven years on Law and Order, worked with Dick Wolf, extraordinary writer, and just actually a very fun, cool dude. So Eric, welcome to uh, the World from <laughs> Money Talks. <laughs> I like that last part. Just an overall fun dude. <laughs> <laughs> overall fun dude. <laughs> I got a good resume, but overall fun dude. <laughs> Just a fun dude. So talk a little bit, Eric, about like, how do you become a writer? Like, I mean, you yourself have made this a career. You make great money. So, I mean, we're going to talk about books for the folks listening, but just how did you become a writer? I mean, writing. Well, I mean, things. you know, yeah. I mean, writing is the execution of a thought, obviously. Being able to download that, to use a very, you know, buzzy word, be able to download your thoughts and put it into a sentence structure that doesn't jumble together. So I literally became a writer in college where I never took English because I was so busy in the arts. I had, I was doing theater. I was in the band. I was also a marketing major. Um, and I just skipped over English. So I was a junior before I took my first English class in college. And it was called Bonehead English. And I had to write. So, yeah, I started to learn how to journal. And I started journaling and, you know, years of that. But my first job, I left college early to take with Dick Wolf. I had to get approval from the dean of Craig Business School at Fresno State. And I kind of just jumped into suddenly working for one of the greatest producers and writers of uh, television of all time. So... That's kind of like how I landed there. How I stayed there is another, I guess, animal in itself because learning how to write television is a very difficult thing. Learning arcs and beats and how to really extrapolate a story and make it compelling is tough. So it's been a long road and I've pretty much written everything. But yeah, the book world is uh, its a great place to make money. And so... Why do you move to the book place versus the film place? Because uh, you've told me about many of the deals. So just for the education of the audience, elaborate a little bit more on the TV writing, the movie writing. Like that's a very different world in writing than book writing. And we'll jump over to books and why books are so lucrative. Okay. Well, you know, there's the collective bargain agreement between the Writers Guild, Directors Guild, Producers Guild allows for a schedule of minimums. We can't work for, a, you know, a network uh, write an episode of TV or write a movie for a studio without making at least this much. You know, it's, it's a standard union contract. But in the TV world, if you write an episode of television of a hit show, say, for instance, if you write an hour drama, you write an episode of Law & Order, you make 42000 something to write that episode. And then you get the residuals every time that plays again. For the life of the thing, you know, of course, there's a step-down deal where I think it bottoms out at like 2% of the original deal is what you make. But if you create that show, you make, I think it's like $90,000 an episode, just as the royalty of the creator. So people often ask how Dick became a billionaire. And that's because he created a lot of hit shows. And so every time, even if he didn't write it, he was getting that. And then he was getting his uh, executive producer fee on top of that. It kind of adds up very fast. but. Television, if you write an episode, you could essentially make around $100,000 for that one job. And, you know, our good friend Robert Allen always teaches us, you know, the multiple streams of income and residual income and the importance of having that in your, I guess, arsenal. Television is a great way of doing that. That being said, it's crowded. A lot of people want that job because it's a cushy job, not a cushy job, but it can be um, a lucrative job as far as. The movie business, that's a wide open 
ended thing because the scale for a movie that's budgeted at five million and above, which pretty much every movie is now budgeted that high, you know, you're making uh, a minimum of 120 grand, and then it's uh, you know, the sky's the limit, whatever the market can bear. So, you know, a friend of mine. He gets $4 million every time he writes a script, no matter what, if they shoot it or not. That's just his flat fee. But he is a, uh, a different kind of animal in the movie business because those types of writer deals are gone. You know, like over at Law & Order uh, in the TV world, we used to have a room full of writers. In the writer's room, there's a great article in the Variety, uh, which is a trade magazine for the movie business and television business. It's the disappearance of the writer's room. Now they have these little, well, I guess, like pilot or satellite rooms where they don't have to pay you an overall deal. They just pay you for your time. They don't commit to anything. It's like, well, if something comes out of this, then we'll pay you. So they're mitigating risk across the board. And that's just because all the studios are now in very large corporations. And when your studio is in the same business as the people that sell a refrigerator, you know, you're, you're in trouble. So <laughs> um, it used to be recession proof. Anytime that, you know, that the economy took a dip and the people in the movie industry knew that we were totally fine because people always go to movies. And in 2008, when everything really went down, yeah. it was way back then, GE owned NBC universal and the movie business itself made money. The television business itself made money. But the appliance divisions and GE itself took a big hit. So a lot of jobs at the studio level got trimmed and a lot of costs got trimmed because they weren't selling enough refrigerators and washing machines. So the game just you know changed in the mid-90s and now we're at the hurt of uh, every other business out there. So we aren't recession-proof like we once were. Yep. So let's talk about the best ways to make money selling books. Well, first of all, you got to write it. So, you know, <laughs> when I wrote my five New York Times, right, that was 2000, really six to 12. You know, we rode that wave through probably 14. And then, you know, we're up writing now the current working title, which I don't know that we're going to keep it, but making marijuana millionaires. So New York Times are different than Amazon. And back in the day, there wasn't such a thing. And New York Times was kind of the pivotal you know, the holy grail to go for. But that's all changed too. Like everybody and their dog and cat are writers at this point. So just talk about the distinctions of the differences and then how do you still make money in this space with it, this time? Well, like you said, the best way to make money in the book business is write a killer book. No matter what it is, if it's a narrative, you know, you're telling a story about, you know, 10 people on a train and someone gets killed, you have to write a compelling book now more than ever because people are so lazy that they don't like to read as much as they used to. They would rather watch. The trend is showing that, you know, even children, they're watching more than they're reading. And as a writer who, you know, I, I wrote a book called Saltwater Taffy, which is directed at, you know, kids ages between eight and like 12. Well, those kids aren't reading. If they don't have to, they're not just picking up a book for enjoyment. They'd rather watch it. They'd rather stream it. They'd rather play games on their phone. They'd li rather do anything but sit down and read. So with that changing landscape of the market, you got to make sure that the book is just awesome. And it's extremely hard to get an agent nowadays because everybody, like you said, is calling themselves a writer. Just because you're a blogger, that doesn't mean you're a writer. You're somebody that's sure putting words down on a page, but writing story, even in the world of nonfiction books, like, you know, a self-help book, a how-to book, a finance book. There has to be an overall narrative to the story of the book. What is the story of the book? What are you trying to teach? Well, what's the arc of that message? How do we get there? We can't just go, you know, first page, blurt it out and say, oh, the secret to this is this. No one's going to read page two. So I always like to use the phrase, you, you have to cliffhang your audience on literally every page now. It used to be like in the movie business where, you know, story structure, the three act structure, it's a famous, you know, it's a famous thing. There's a, Sid Field wrote a book years and years ago. And, you know, there was three basic plot points where you twist 
the story. Now audiences are so preoccupied with so many different things and so many options between all of the streaming platforms and all of that stuff that you have to really be twisting and churning. Your story has got to be rocking on every page. There's no more fluff, which I guess is a good thing. It's cutting out all the, the muck, but you know, the best way to make that money is to write a killer book. Now, that being said, you can write a great book, and if nobody reads it, <laughs> you're not making any money. Writing is about, you know, Mark Richter Hansen, a client of mine, he once wrote a really great book with his buddy Jack Canfield. And that book was turned down, I don't know, Laura, what, what was it? Some crazy number. It was like 140 times. Yeah. Like 39 different publishers. And they were told that, you know, no one's going to want to read this feel good book and, you know, a, a collection of stories. Well, they believed in it and, and they really thought, okay, if, if we can connect to the heart of the reader, uh, we're going to do something. And they're in the Guinness Book of World Records for selling the most nonfiction books. So, you know, writing a great book, you have to make sure that you have a plan. And that plan is so, Marco and Bob always used to say, uh, uh, Robert Allen, I'm doing shorthand here. Um, they always used to say, writing is about 10% of the job. The other 90 or 85% is marketing. You have to have a plan how you're going to roll this out. And now with social media and how many followers and influencers or, you know, all of this stuff, it's almost like I know of uh, a writer that will still remain unnamed. Carol wrote a terrible book, had a killer marketing plan and became a New York Times bestseller with, I think, in the first week. It also helped that, you know, she had, she married a billionaire and he pretty much made sure that this book was going to uh, jump off the shelf. But, the, uh, you know, I had to give it up because the marketing plan was brilliant. I tell you the marketing plan, but then you could figure out who it is. But your marketing plan has to be rock solid. And when I wrote Saltwater Taffy, I'm mostly a ghostwriter in the world of books. But when I, I penned a, a children's book, adventure book, I went around to places that I had worked. And I went to random and they said, oh, you know, you got to change this. You got to change this. You can't put these things at the end of the chapter called treasure tips. And I was like, that's the whole reason I'm writing this book because I want to teach the kids that how you talk to yourself matters. Even though I'm telling them a story about, you know, buried treasure and Fourth of July weekend and fun and adventure, I wanted to speak to that, that heart of a, of a 10 year old to say, man, how, how you talk to yourself matters. How you think at night matters. How you treat other people matters. So when they didn't, you know, wouldn't let me leave those in, I said, I'm going on my own. And I viewed it as just basically a, uh, like an independent film. And I went to every distributor and publisher in town and I got turned down by all of them. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to FedEx this killer package. And I had this, I had the galley in there. I had uh, saltwater taffy, a bunch of stickers, and I had like a, 25 page marketing plan, all written out who I know, who, I, how I'm going to sell this book. And I got a call that afternoon from the senior vice president of what was then Perseus, which is now Ingram content. So you have to figure out, okay, uh, if there's so many people trying to sell a book, why is my book special? Everybody thinks, wow, my book is so awesome. You're going to love it. But that's not the case. Take a step back from your product, whatever you've written, and then you have to really kind of take a hard look at it saying, okay, why is this great? Why is it so amazing that someone's going to got to rush out and buy it? And the answer is because every page is just rich with content. Does that kind of answer your question? It's a long way to go to answer a question, but. Oh, absolutely. So in that, and I'm going to say it's the same conversation, but we've been like the benefits the pros and cons of like I said doing the traditional way doing it independent as you said agents are becoming more and more challenging I mean given that everyone's an author and I love that you said you know bloggers aren't authors I mean they are but not like the flavor we're talking about um <laughs> you know <laughs> you, you stay independent you do the traditional model get an agent do that whole thing what are the pros and cons well here's the thing and you know this came from uh somebody that has sold a couple hundred million books. And, you know, he once told me, he said, look, 
everybody wants to sell their book to a publisher. And that sort of strokes the ego that says, oh, I sold my book to Penguin or I sold my book to Dutton or, you know, whatever. That was the way it used to be. That's the only way to get to market back in, you know, in the day. Now the channels of distribution are wide open. So, you know, a lot of people don't know John Grisham sold books out of his trunk, A Time to Kill, his first book. And nobody really kind of believed that that was going to be something. And well, now look at him, he's a, you know, a cottage name who uses a lot of ghostwriters. Uh, God bless him for that. because <laughs> He keeps people like me in, in, in employment. But the traditional way of selling your book, most of the time, and this is how the, uh, the business model of publishing is set up. Most of the time, the advance that you get from a publisher, pretty much going to be the only money you see, unless, it just jumps off the shelf. Unless That's you're a celebrity. So <laughs> yeah. And, and unless you're a celebrity who has a huge reach, unless you have a strategy of coordinated clicks where you can pay somebody to buy your book. So, you know, you have the money to make money or to call yourself, you know, a certain a strategy. You got to call it forth and say, okay, I know 10 people and they know 10 people and they know 10 people, you know, it's like the Wayne's world and so on and so on and so on. So unless you have that, it's very difficult to gain traction because a publisher is not going to go out there and just throw money after your book. They already spent money. And what they're going to do is they're going to wait around. And if your book doesn't jump, I used to say, you know, if it's not going to jump off the shelves, it gets pulled at the Barnes and Noble bookstores. Well, now most of the books are sold online, but if your metadata and it doesn't start ranking or have some type of trend or some type of traction, you're just going to be a backlisted title with one of these giant publishers. And every time they sell a book, you're not getting anything until they make their money back. And you know how net profits work in the world of uh, big business. They'll find a way. I mean, if Forrest Gump hasn't made money in, in the eyes of Paramount, you think your little title at the, over at Random House is going to you know, suddenly make you a gazillionaire? It ain't. So the best way is to own your copyright. And Mark told me that years ago. He's like, look, you have to own your intellectual property. And if you own that title and chain of title, when and if that book jumps, then you can really make some money. Like Saltwater Taffy, I own that. My wife and I and my kids. We own that title, and I'm going to make a uh, a movie out of it, which is like a Stand By Me meets the Goonies. And when that, you know, I make a movie, that's a giant billboard for the book because everybody wants to read the source material. You know, that book sells for fifteen ninety five, I think the the retail price is. So every time that sells, I'll make eight dollars. If it was owned by somebody else, I would make twenty five thirty cents a copy, maybe. So it's a drastic difference, but you know, you got to be able to withstand and have a, you know, a, a risk palette that is really high. And most artists don't, which is why, you know, the movie business and book business and everything has been the way it has been for years. They're like, Oh, they, they, they need the money. I'll just go in and lowball them and they'll take it. And then we own the copyright. So, I mean, what's the famous story about Tolstoy where his, he made nothing off of war and peace. Yeah, there's a, there's a funny story about, about him and his estate finally had to sue the publisher because they, I don't know, they, they kind of worked him somehow. But that's the difference between traditional and independent or owning your copyright. Traditional, unless you're a superstar or you have some, you know, like you're Sully, you just landed a plane on the Hudson. You, got, you don't have a built-in marketing plan, something like that that people want to talk to you about, then, you know, keep your copyright and put it, you know, through the channels of distribution of online. I mean, now Writer's Digest, my buddy Phil Sexton over there is the publisher of Writer's Digest. And he saw that self-publishing was starting to boom. And so now they have a division of self-publishing. They'll help uh, authors publish their book. And, you know, they're getting into that game. And everybody has some type of avenue of helping an author get their book to market. But if you don't have, again, that traction, after you and your friends buy 10 copies each, it doesn't continue. 
So that's kind of my answer versus traditional versus independent. Well, you talked a lot through that question and the, well, the answer to how to market. So, you know, I've marketed five New York times. I mean, and what you said is exactly the truth. I mean, those the initial, you know, retainers that you get is kind of it unless you get that book to move. And there's so many online strategies to get it to move. But I want you also to talk marketing in the light. I'm going to put a little shadow on it, which is celebrities have all sorts of books coming out. I mean, if you look at the top list, I mean, anybody that's got a celebrity name is making it, whether the content's good or bad. Would you agree with that, not agree with that? That seems to be the trend if you look at the bestseller list. Well, it's just further strip mining of, of a product. You know, think about this. Back in the day when Mark Twain was an author and he wrote this little book called uh, Huckleberry Finn, if Mark Twain were alive today, they would want uh, 20 books. They wouldn't want just one classic. They wouldn't want to leave it there. They want to strip mine every possible avenue to make as much money as fast as they can. That's why somebody suddenly gets famous overnight. Within four to six months, there'll be a book on the shelf because it's hot. It's trending. And, you know, it won't be there in, I don't know, seven, eight months time. The very first TV show I ever worked on was uh, Nasty Boys. This is a Dick Wolf show. Law and Order was still a pilot that didn't get an order at that point. But Cuba Gooding Jr. was a day player in this show. And, well, he went on to win an Oscar for his role in Jerry Maguire. And his agents put him into the biggest offers there was. You know, here's a way to, to make as much money. Here's a huge offer from Disney. We're going to do this. Or here's a huge offer from Universal. We're going to do this. And his follow-up to winning an Oscar was Snow Dogs and the movie bombed and his career took a very big hit because he was in like three bombs right after winning an Oscar. And so instead of sitting back and waiting and being picky, the agents pushed him into a, a situation where they could extrapolate the most money. And so these celebrities, they're looking in now, you know, this cross, market strategy. How do we get her into, you know, like say we have a client, she's a great singer. Well, how do we get her into movies? How do we get her into commercials? How do we get her into publishing? Okay, let's find a ghostwriter and, and write a book about uh, her near-death experience or uh, whatever. They'll find a way. And so now everybody's got a book and every product has a book. Like, uh, have you seen the movie Free Solo? No. Okay, it's a National Geographic. Just won a, a, a documentary uh, Academy Award, and it's about a guy who climbed Mount uh, El Capitan. It's across from Half Dome in Yosemite. Yep. Okay, it's it three. Well. Okay, so it's three thousand feet of pure rock granite, and the guy climbed up it in three hours with no ropes. No one in the entire world has ever done that. So immediately, because the program hit a National Geographic channel on Sunday night. Well, today, two days after that airing on, on TV, the book comes out, The Impossible Climb. So I think I'm just plugging The Impossible Climb. Uh, but it's a great story. The guy did something that no one ever did. So even he's got a book. Did he write it? Absolutely not. Did he have a great story? Absolutely. And did somebody sit there and help him write the book? Yeah. Co-authored, ghostwritten, whatever it is. But the best way to make money in, in any industry, especially the arts, is to make sure that you're clicking on all cylinders and publishing music, movies, commercials. That's how to get the, the most bang for the buck. And is there any specific, um, we got to head uh, to the end of our podcast already. So at some point we'll have you back. We'll talk about uh, some uh, new books coming out or new books specifically coming out later this year. But talk about online marketing. Just give a few ninja tricks. I mean, that is a, a wheelhouse by itself. But what advice would you give the, the listeners for some things to hit, hit bestsellers using the Internet? Yeah, well, it's going to depend on your audience. See, my audience, you know, for Saltwater Taffy is children. And I, you know, I thought too many different ways. How could I market this with, without, you know, spending a ton of money? Sure, you can, you know, a strategy can be, you know, blogging or getting on social media and, you know, finding followers and follow and using things like Jarvee, which is a, 
a self-posting way of gaining followers, buying followers, all that is, you know, stuff. But you've got to be creative. So just as an example, one of my best marketing pieces and how I got to sell 58,000 copies of, of Saltwater Tappy was making a bookmark. I made a, I made a bookmark and really cool colors and, you know, the, the picture of the book and, you know, one of the characters in the book on the back and, you know, just a real fun book that says, you know, sweet on it. And everywhere I spoke, I would give these bookmarks free. And then I created this program online that said free bookmarks for children, free bookmarks for elementary kids, free bookmarks for book clubs. And every time somebody across the world typed in free bookmarks for children or free bookmarks for kids or whatever the, you know, the, the key words that I chose, I would get a request. And it would cost me $1.42 to send out about 100 of these postcards. But I suddenly started seeing sales all over the country. And there is no one quick, perfect tool. It's a compilation of all of the tools. Find a strategy and don't think, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not making bookmarks. Well, I did, you know, or could partner with a, you know, a, a, a company and have a company, instead of trying to sell a million books, sell a million books to one person, a company. They're going to give it out at their next sales conference. And they, yep. you know, boom, you just sold 250,000 copies. And yep. you price it that's, you know, $4 and you're making a buck a book, but hey, you just made a quarter million dollars. There's a, there's a million ways to make books. I mean, to make money in books, but you just got to be smart. And But it all begins with writing a killer book. Exactly. Eric, it's been <laughs> great to have you on Laurel's Real Money Talks. And uh, you are in the process of writing a, at least a one killer book. I know that. And uh, we'll be talking more through our podcast uh, in this year. And if you would like an interview or to talk to Eric directly about his work, you can go to Ask Laurel, A-S-K-L-O-R-A-L, AskLaurel.com. And uh, just put in your name, phone number, a request, a question, and we will be right back to you. So uh, stay tuned for more on Laurel's Real Money Talks. And uh, coming next is how to invest your IRA. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Real Money Talks podcast. Your host has been Laurel Langmire, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View. Want to learn more about off Wall Street investing, tax strategies, and multi-million dollar business strategies? Visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast for past episodes, show notes, and resources. For some special wealth building gifts only for Laurel's podcast listeners, visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast gifts. Do you have a burning question for Laurel? Visit asklaurel.com to submit your question, and it may just be covered on a podcast episode. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe to get new episodes every week.